everybody. It's fantastic that everyone's made it, especially right in here to the theatre at Rue Air Live. It's great to see you all, despite the train uh, dramas that everyone's had getting here. But it's also fantastic to see so many young faces in the audience. And I know that our next guest is particularly excited about meeting some young fans later on, so we'll make sure that happens. Um, she has had such a phenomenal last couple of seasons. She's just rising and rising in the ranks of professional cycling. Let's get us straight up here, shall we? Put your hands together for Demi Vollering. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. Now, firstly, aside from cycling, how's your time been here in London? What have you been up to? Um, we didn't have that much time, but uh, this morning we went uh, for some different uh, coffee stops, so uh, that was nice. Yeah, did, have you done like the tourist bit, like <laughs> seen very much? No, not too much, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it, it's so big, so uh, it's a bit difficult, I think, to, to see so much in a short time, but uh, yeah, it was really nice to, to walk a bit over the streets and see some nice coffee uh, shops they have here. And last night, some good dinner, so it was good. Amazing. And I think it's always very interesting because when I talk to yourself as a rider and your other colleagues in the peloton, it's always a case of, have you been to this city? Have you experienced that? And actually, you're, you're saying to us, well, we've been there, but we were racing, so yeah. we see absolutely nothing. It's a head down yeah. and absolutely not looking around in that environment. Yeah, exactly. And, and we are lucky um, if we are a few days before, then we do some easy rides together with the team. Um, but uh, yeah, then you see a little bit, but also not that much. I mean, then, then you do an easy spin from one hour, two hours maybe, and then you go back to the hotel room and eat and rest, sleep. Um, so yeah, mostly you see your hotel room in the, from the inside. <laughs> I know, and I think we always see that glamorous side, but actually just how much discipline and focus is there in, in that environment at a race? You mean in the race, how much? I guess around the race, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of us thinking, oh, they might have a nice couple of days here, but actually it's yeah. all discipline. Yeah, exactly. So in the end, yeah, we come to a lot of places, but uh, yeah, you see only the little bit in the training before or, or during the race. I also try to enjoy it a little bit, but sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you, you, see, you see a lot of things on the, from the bike, and that's, that's nice because... On the bike, you see so much more uh, out of a car than out of a car or something. So, yeah, it's it's the bike is the best way to explore, of course. Only in races, not uh, not the best way, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know it was really special for you to want to be here today because we have, as I mentioned before, a lot of young little fans in the audience. Why is that important to you? Uh, I mean. When I was younger, I uh, did ice skating, and uh, I really liked to, to give trainings to children and see uh, children coming outside, enjoying uh, <laughs> being, being outside, um, and, and doing something active, just do some sporting. And I really like to, to do that, uh, to take the children out, uh, give them some nice, nice games to play outside, or um, yeah, on the ice ring, some good training, so uh, yeah, I always really enjoy to, to inspire the kids. And <laughs> we've just seen the image come up. I mean, firstly, the shoes. Talk yeah. us through those. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Dutch shoes. <laughs> I was going to say, they're looking yeah. on point for Dutch shoes. Yeah. <laughs> How old are you here? Ooh, I think I was here almost two, two or something. I don't know exactly, but two or something, I think. Got the, uh, mm -hmm. got the right colored bike already as well, matching yeah. the shoes. <laughs> um, it's interesting you just touched upon the fact that it's fun. You want to play games and encourage the children to do that. When you first started cycling, how was your relationship with the bike? Was it fun and passion from the beginning? Yeah, I mean, the beginning was, was like this, uh, going on the bike, playing, uh, yeah, so racing a bit in the streets with the other children. and. Uh, I don't know, I really like to be outside on the bike and uh, I, I always wanted to race, um, but in the beginning it was a bit more difficult because I came from uh, a, a bit a big family, so I had younger sisters and a brother. Um, 
so yeah, it was a bit difficult to go ar around uh, the, uh, the Netherlands and do a lot of races. So in the beginning, I didn't do the real races, but more the, um, yeah, the children races. We call them Dikke Banden Race, so on the fat tire, uh, like the school bikes, uh, that kind of racing I did. And I, I thought it was so cool. Um, and I really wanted to do the real races, but that took a time uh, before I could do that. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy to just be outside and, and being a bit playful on the bike. Um, and always I was really competitive, so uh, I, I just really wanted to do the real races. <laughs> and it's amazing that you could combine that fun with being competitive, because not everyone can manage that. No, exactly, no. I mean, you need to, be, you need to have a bit of both, I think. Um, you need to have the fun. Um, yeah, to be also competitive, I think, uh, because if you're only really competitive, then in the end it's not fun anymore, because in, in, in cycling especially, you will lose m more than that you can win, so if you don't have the fun in it, then it will be hard, I think. It's a really lovely philosophy and a nice reminder. <laughs> Another brilliant image um, behind us here on the stage. This is your dog. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is Flo. <laughs> Tell us about your relationship with Flo, because uh, there's so many images of you. I think I saw one where you're getting aero with Flo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Flo is really an adventure dog also, so she really likes to, to be outside and uh, come with us uh, on the adventures. And uh, most of the times I'm on my bike, and of course it's difficult for her to keep up. So, uh, yeah, this is on the gravel bike also, so... Uh, <laughs> She, she really likes to run next to the bike, uh, so when it's uphill and on a quiet road, I, I let her go and then she, she runs next to the bike and uh, yeah, then at one point she's a bit tired and I put her in a backpack, but she likes it so much because she can see from my back, she can so, see so much, so then I'm riding and she's looking around, see all the birds Aww. and yeah, she really loves it. That is absolutely brilliant. And yeah. how, how long, um, how many miles can you get in with, with Flo still being happy in the backpack? Can you do a long one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not too much because she is, she is not uh, that small, of course. So she, uh, her weight is 15 kilos. So in the end, you have a pretty sore back also. And it's mm. good training. I mean, it's good core work. But uh, most of the times I... I uh, switch a bit between my partner, partner and me, and then, uh, yeah, also she is running a bit loose, so I think around 20k uh, an hour uh, that we do uh, together with her, and uh, yeah, then I do some more training, or most of the times only on the easy days she goes with us. <laughs> I was going to ask you later in this interview what's your key to success, but it's clear that it's this yeah. training with the dog, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> you get really strong from it. <laughs> Everybody's going to be doing this for next season, I yeah. think, after the performances you put in. And am I right in saying that you also do uh, a bit of yoga with Flo involved as well? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything I do, she wants to do with me. So if I put my yoga mat out uh, in the morning, uh, she's immediately on it. And uh, I need to put, it a bit, put her a bit away because otherwise I don't have space to move anymore. But uh, yeah, she, she enjoys it uh, to be always with me. Uh, so yeah, I mean, yoga is really nice uh, to start the day always with, so uh, that's one of the things I always do. As well as it being a really nice thing to do, yoga off the bike, how important is it to look after your body when you do so many grueling miles out in the elements to do that other side of strength and conditioning? Uh, for me, it's really important, I think, um, Especially because I come from speed skating, uh, you do a lot of stretching always. You always warm up before you go on the ice ring, and then after you, you did your training on the ice ring, you, you do cooling down, uh, so you do a little lap of running and you stretch. Um, you're always really busy with this uh, to, to warm up the muscles, and in cycling you never do that. Um, you always go on the bike and puff, you're off. Um, so from out of speed uh, ice skating, I, I was used to stretch uh, before I, I stepped uh, on the ice ring or something. So I, I took that with me um, uh, when I was uh, completely focused on cycling. So always in the morning, I tried to st stretch a bit. Um, and then after I ro rode my bike, uh, it felt always so good to, to just stretch the legs. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I mean, in COVID year, uh, we had a lot more time and I always wanted to try yoga. And actually it's, it's also stretching, but a bit, um, a bit longer, a bit uh, more, um, a, bit a new uh, challenge for myself also. So then I started with yoga and um, just in the mornings, uh, can be 10 minutes and then uh, and then I start my day off and uh, yeah I kept doing that and uh, I really like it because yeah normally if you jump out of bed uh, you start the day and everything is hurry 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 and now you step out your bed you do first some relaxing yoga and I don't know it it makes also that your day starts different you you make some time for yourself already in the beginning of the morning so that that feels good that's really nice and actually I think yoga can be really hard as well yeah I mean you have also some power yoga or pilates that that's a lot of core work um, but in the morning I do just easy stretching nice yeah. and and do you think everyone in the peloton recognizes the importance of strength and conditioning work now and doing yoga or are there some people that still go oh I don't want to stretch I don't want to do that I think there are still people who don't want to do that, of course, but I think it's, it's coming more and more. I mean, uh, cycling, uh, especially by the women's you see that, that, that they are complete athletes and they want to be not only good on the bike, but just a good athlete. And that's also for myself. I, I really uh, think it's important to also do the core work, even it's, it's not a nice training, but I think it's important um, because yeah, on the bike, in the end, it's not only pushing the pedals. It's especially on the planche belle fille, for example, you really need your core to sit stable on the bike. And yeah, you use every muscle if you do it right. So um, for me, it's important to do it. We'll talk more about that climb a little bit later because there's yeah. so much to dive into with the images we can see behind. Um, but you were talking there about your routine in the morning and doing some yoga. And something else I've noticed is you have the same rocket coffee machine yeah. as me. And I have a very important question. Can you do coffee art? Coffee art. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you follow me on Instagram, you can see I cannot do it good. But <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm improving a lot. <laughs> I'm still at the point where I, I just have a blob of like frothy milk in the top. I mean, that's a, as far as it's gone. Do you have any tips for me to improve? Yeah, I mean, uh, how you um, shape the milk, I think that's the important part already. And then, um, yeah, the, the, the handling, it's, it's difficult. You, you need to practice it. It's practice, practice, practice. <laughs> Why is coffee such a thing for cyclists? I don't know, maybe because you have so much time? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, uh, yeah, caffeine, uh, caffeine you use always in the races, of course. So, uh, I don't know, I, I really like it. And also, when you go on a bike ride, some nice coffee stop is also really nice always. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just also, it, it uh, belongs in my morning routine. After my yoga, I put on my rocket uh, machine and then... Uh, yeah, I do my breakfast and I make a nice coffee and then, and then I'm ready for the day. I'm sure a lot of people here will be happy to know that you still have a coffee stop on your training rides <laughs> because to be at your level, we don't always imagine you have time to stop. <laughs> yeah, of course, not always. I mean, most of the trainings uh, I don't stop, but uh, especially soon when I start uh, riding my bike again um, after this off season, um, then you do always the easy rice, and in easy rice, uh, it's always nice to stop for a coffee. How much time do you get for the off season in reality? Um, now I had, uh, yeah, almost three weeks uh, without a bike. I think. Um, I mean, the first week after uh, the fir first week of my off season was a bit difficult because uh, I felt super shit uh, after. Uh, after uh, the tour of Romandia, so um, and it was weird because yeah, my season ended a bit strange because I got COVID at the Worlds and then Romandia was not that good. I didn't recover and yeah, I feel not good. So after Romandia, uh, Romandia, I was completely empty. So I also needed some time off the bike. I mean, I was really still. I really wanted to ride the bike, but I was just empty or something. So I couldn't. And then I just did some easy walks with my dog, but was also very nice. Um, and then after a week, uh, I felt a bit more like uh, settled in my rest or something. You feel also that you come to a rest because the first week it feels a bit awkward, a bit weird to not have your bike, uh, not sitting on the bike the whole time. And yeah, then 
my last two weeks uh, of uh, holiday uh, was very nice. And when you have a rest day, you often will, as professional cyclists, have to still ride gently to keep the legs fresh. In the off season, is it completely off the bike? Yeah, now I have two weeks, two weeks uh, without a bike at all. Uh, normally, when I go on holiday, I always rent uh, maybe a mountain bike or something uh, because I just really like it to, to explore uh, in a new country or something. So then it's nice to rent a mountain bike and see a bit more. But um, yeah, now we had uh, two weeks in Sicily and uh, yeah, we didn't touch the bike. We did, of course, some runs because I always also really like uh, running or hiking. So that was what we did now. But um, yeah, two weeks, no bike. It was new. No. And do you have to avoid running during the season in case you were injured? Or can no. you still do it? Um, I always try to, to keep running a little bit in my schedule. And of course, between races, it's difficult, um, especially for, for example, uh, in the spring classics, it's really difficult to, if you have two or three days in between the races, yeah, you, you don't run. Um, but if I have a longer training period, uh, I always try to put some running in my trainings because running is also a kind of a core work. Um, so I really like to, to use also my other muscles. Um, yeah, and running also, if you do it a lot, then, then your body is used to it. Um, but if you stop running for a long time and you pick it up again, it costs always a lot of energy because you've got so much muscle pain. Um, so I always try to, to keep running a little bit in my schedule. Just casting an eye back, good to the screen again. I mean, what a beautiful image. When you do have a couple of weeks off, does it give you a chance to reflect and look back at just how much you've achieved in the last two seasons? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, sometimes it's good to, to look back, uh, back, and especially as an athlete, you're so focused uh, on moving forward. Um, it's always from one goal to another goal to another goal. and. You don't have much time in the season to look back and think how everything went. So, um, yeah, in off-season, of course, you think a lot back. And also, you have some evaluation uh, talks with, uh, with, with, with the team. Um, and that's really good to, to see uh, what was good, but what also can be better. Um, so, yeah, I had a lot of time to think about last year. And, uh, yeah, that was nice. <laughs> Pretty happy. <laughs> yeah. Pretty happy with that. And, again, I'd like to go back to the beginning uh, for a little bit to understand kind of how you got to where you are today. I mean, the title of this talk is The Next Superstar. I think we could all agree you're already a superstar of cycling. It's been phenomenal to watch your progress so quickly from the outside. You mentioned earlier about skating, and there's a lot of Dutch riders that have come from that background as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as a Dutch, you always do two things. Uh, you start, uh, uh, yeah, to train, uh, and that's, yeah, ice skating is very important for us, and cycling as well. Um, and I think ice skating, you use also a bit similar muscles, so it's uh, pretty easy to combine. Uh, as an ice skater, you sit also a lot of on the bike. Um, the other way around, not so much. But um, yeah, I think as an ice skater, we have so many good ice skaters in Holland. So uh, if you cannot make it to the top top, because that's super difficult in Holland, then um, yeah, then automatically uh, you start searching for another um, goal, of course. And yeah, for me, it, 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 cycling was always something what I really liked uh, to do. And um, it felt very natural to step over into cycling. Now, many, many, many years ago, I used to race a bike, but it was very hard as a youth, as a kid, junior rider, as a, as a female to find any racing in the UK back in, in those times. Did you have a lot of opportunities to race as a little girl? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, it started already with the, those uh, fat bike races, uh, the fat, fat tire races. And um, yeah, after, after that, uh, when I was 16 and I started with the real races, um, you had a lot of, uh, of races. Uh, you have the, the, the club competition, uh, and that was really nice. Uh, yeah. Almost every weekend, I think every weekend you could race somewhere, um, or it was a criterium, or it was a little classic uh, race for the for us. So yeah, that 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 makes it also that uh, the Dutchies are so uh, successful, I think. Um, 
yeah, that was, that was really nice that you could always race somewhere. And also, something we've discussed before, is the structure around cycling as a form of getting around um, in Holland. It, it's huge. It's always been so part of life, growing up riding a bike day to day. Does that influence why there's so much success in professional ranks? Does that cross over? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, as a kid, you, you learn to ride your bike because it's one of the biggest um, things in Holland. You, you go to, to school on the bike, you go to your work on the bike, so um, that makes it also that so big sport, I think. And when did it become super competitive? When did you decide, right, this is my career, I'm, I'm going to go absolutely everything into racing bikes? Um, I think this was uh, the year 2018, um, when I just met my boyfriend uh, before that, and he said already, yeah, you're very talented, uh, you should go focus only on cycling, um, and, and stop with ice skating. At first I said, fuck you, <laughs> I don't want to quit ice skating, I, I really like it, I love it, um, but then, um, yeah, my ice skating se season was not good, and Eventually, I, I ended up um, riding my bike more and more, going on a training camp and also with him, going to the Ardennes. Uh, yeah, that was really nice. Um, and then, yeah, I, I started to train more and also I, I came, um, I, tra I started training with a trainer and uh, then it went very fast. Uh, I mean, the next year I was with Parkertel already, so... Yeah, I think the year before Parkertel was only the year I started seriously. Because I was going to say that it feels very fast from my standpoint that you've progressed. And it's interesting that that is the reality. It has been fast. Yeah, I mean, before that, I also was riding my bike pretty often and uh, also in, uh, in combination with ice skating, but just... Uh, as, as something I really like to do. Uh, after school, I went on the bike, just do an hour, or I went to the, um, the, the little club uh, in the close by, and I did some uh, evening races and evening crit. Um, so it was really playful, I think, always, and I didn't really train, uh, I didn't do efforts or something. So, yeah, I, I just did the races and some easy rides, uh, and it was really nice. And in the winter, I was on the, on the ice ring. Um, so yeah, when I started to train uh, for real with the trainer, uh, it went very fast because uh, I could improve so much. Uh, first, I started to do efforts and that kind of things, and some longer rides. And yeah, after that, um, I was still, I, I came already by Parkato, and I never did, uh, for example, I never went to the gym or something. I, of course, I, we did the land trainings uh, for ice skating, but then I started to also do some wide training. And yeah, I mean, there was so much improvement also left for me because I did years before always so playful and um, not so structured yet. So there was so much space to improve and that, uh, that helped also a lot, I think. And when you went into Park Hotel and the team set up there, was it a big change for you? Was there a big shift in training and structure? Yeah, I mean, um, every year uh, that, 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 yeah, when I started with my trainer, every year after that, you start to train a bit more and more and more, um, and also different kind of trainings. Um, so yeah, that, th that trainings you always, I, I, I build it up, up and, um, I think there, for the trainings, it did not really change for my feelings so much because I kept the same trainer and yeah, we just made sure that I improved, uh, but not too fast. So that, that space for improving also stayed there. Um, but of course, I, I came in an environment that was much more professional and uh, I made a little money from it. So that was also nice. I stopped with working the year before. so. Um, yeah, I mean, then you also a bit more free uh, to do really what you like and to go really all in uh, for cycling. I think often, again, as, as fans of the sport, watching from the outside, I can say, right, that was your biggest win or that was a real breakthrough moment. But in your mind, what was the first time that you went home with a result and you just thought, like, I'm so happy with that achievement in the peloton? Um... 
I think it was Liège uh, 2019, because that was my first uh, pro year, but also immediately a third place. So that was very special for me. And I know that you always, always reflect, and especially as we were saying in the off season, you, you look back at what you've achieved, what you want to achieve the next time. And I'm going to see if my memory is serving me correctly now. Brabant Spiel 2021? Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that, because we'll go on to talk about all the many, many successes. But that was a photo finish. Yeah. And I don't know if anybody knows what I'm referring to here. I don't unfortunately think we have that photo finish. But you thought you'd got it on the line and then found out actually not quite. Yeah, I think that was the year from the photo finishes, because in Amstel Gold Race it was the same with Pitcock and, uh, and uh, Van Aert. But, um, yeah, that was very strange. I, I really thought I had it. And also Rudwinder, uh, she, she ended up with the win, of course, but she said to me, I really thought you won. And I said, yeah, I also had that feeling, but in the end it was not, so. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you were going to come to that agreement. Like, no, I think yeah. you definitely, yeah, that's fine. You got yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, Unfortunately, it, it, was, it was very I overruled strange. that. Yeah, and also I... I didn't realize at all, so I, I celebrated already with my teammates, and then I came back by the podium, and there was this man from the jury, and he was a bit laughing at me, so I was like, what's happening? And then he said, yeah, don't celebrate too early, and I was like, why? <laughs> <laughs> why? I won. I won. <laughs> no, you're second. And I was like, what? <laughs> Oh. No, I was not. <laughs> I thought first he was joking or something, but he was not, so it was a bit of pity. <laughs> Does it make you think twice about getting your hands yeah, in the yeah, air now? Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah, now I do it only after the finish line, not on the finish line anymore. <laughs> <laughs> just, just waiting to make sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that really stood out for me around that time is the volume of people commenting, social media, Twitter, people having an opinion. <laughs> did she get it? Did she not? Do you absorb all these things? Do you read social media? Do you listen to it? Yeah, well, first, then... Oh, yeah, there it is. There we go. <laughs> I mean, it's, there's not a huge amount in that, is there? No. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, first, I, I only got this picture um, when I was at the jury, and then I was like, yeah, I lost. But then on the internet afterwards, I saw so many pictures from all kinds of sites, and on all those other pictures, it looks like I won. So it was very different for me. So it was also a bit of a roller coaster because I thought I won, and then they said not. So I thought, okay, I didn't win. And then I opened social media, and I saw all those pictures from all kinds of sites, and I thought, but I, do, I did win, <laughs> so it was very strange to to feel this kind of roller coaster. But in the end, it also it doesn't matter because, I mean, if you're so close to the win, it's also nice, right? <laughs> exactly, and I'm glad to hear you saying that because it was a fantastic race, regardless. And and actually, I do think I tweeted a picture before I saw this where it, from that perspective, really does look like yeah. you're over the line. So, yeah, a fantastic result nonetheless. And you came back the following season and, and sorted that one, didn't you? Yeah, we were joking already, and then... Uh... There we go. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah, it's difficult. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to move on. We're going to yeah. stop. We're stop gonna say, <laughs> not going to say that you definitely won that. Um, but yeah, you, you came back and, and you got the result. Yeah, it was, it was funny because uh, in the meeting before, uh, we were already joking now. Today, then I do solo, then, then it's, yeah, I mean, then it's obvious, right? And also, after this finish, a lot of people said, yeah, just go solo, it's easier. Then they see that you won, and then uh, I was like, yeah, <laughs> I know, I will try next year, and I tried the next year, and yeah, it worked out. <laughs> it certainly did. I mean, I just don't know where to start <laughs> with how well the last two seasons have gone. I mean, has it really just felt like a really big breakthrough season? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think last year was my, my, my big, um, yeah, step up, I think, because I won Liège, of course, and uh, this year was a bit different, of course, because Anna was not in the team as a rider anymore, um, so I needed to get a bit used to that, because um, the year before, I, uh, I was riding with Anna, and that was really nice, because everybody was always watching Anna, and then I could sneak out or do my thing a bit uh, in her shadow, and... Uh, 
yeah, now this year was different because she was not there anymore and they started to look at me and that was a whole different kind of writing for me. It was new, um, but I think I, I handled it well and uh, yeah, it was also good to experience again. So for anyone that doesn't know, Anna van der Bregen retired and went into the team car yeah. as, as director sportive. How has it been having her in your ear? <laughs> yeah, I mean, really nice. I mean, this race was already, she was behind me in the car and she knows how to do this kind of solo. So, uh, yeah, you just do what she says. And I mean, she was always a step before because she really knows what goes through your mind and how you feel. So you're riding solo and before it goes in your mind already from, oh, phew, this is heavy. She says, okay, they mean now it's going to be hard, but you need to keep pu uh, pushing. And she really knows what kind of, things you feel in, in, in a race, so that's really helpful always. Tour de France femme avec Zwift. We have a Tour de France. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what a fantastic inaugural edition it was for you. Um, polka dot jersey, podium. Can, can you just talk us through your reflections on, on the race as a whole? Yeah, I mean, Tour de France was really nice to have, and. Uh, I was really happy with this race, and also when I saw the the, uh, the stages uh, when they announced it, um, I was super happy because um, I live in Switzerland and uh, close to the border to, to French. And in the year of, of COVID, I did a really nice uh, training. Um, uh, I wanted to do something else in another area, and then my boyfriend said, okay, come, we go to the to the French, and then uh, you start at the Grand Ballon, and maybe you can also do Planche Bellefi. So I made a really nice route on Commode, and uh, I started uh, on the bottom of the Grand Ballon, and I rode it, and then I went to Planche Bellefi, and I finished on top there, and um, he waited for me in the car there. And uh, yeah, well, I was riding up uh, Planche Bellefi, I, I started to fantasy I already a little bit about uh, how that would be for the men to race there. And then, uh, yeah, I thought, how would it be if we women race on this kind of mountain? And uh, yeah, then when they announced uh, the, the course, uh, we also uh, came over that uh, two climbs. So that was really special for me. I mean, I did already the recon and I, I knew already how it felt to, to go there. Um, uh, yeah. And, when this race finally started off, I, I was just really happy that, uh, that we had this kind of race back again. Super Planche de Belfi, you've mentioned a couple of times. I mean, the, the gradient of that, the surface, it look, <laughs> looks a bit grippy, to, to say the least. Um, let's talk about your rivalry with Anna Meek van Vluten. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's always very, very hard with her because yeah, you know she's uh, capable of doing uh, super, super hard uh, things in the race. Um, and you know, uh, on this, this, that kind of, uh, kind of climb, she's really good. So yeah, you know she's going to attack somewhere, but of course you don't know where. Um, and I mean, stage seven was, uh, she started immediately off. And um, yeah, you know that it's kind of going to happen. And, uh, normally in races, uh, you feel that the whole, whole bunch is a kind of um, nervous for her attack. I mean, you know that it's going to happen and, and you really want to beat her also. So you need to hang on with her. Um, yeah, and then um, the moment uh, when she went in the tour, uh, I, I did a lot of mental work also. So um, yeah, I, I prepared myself for that moment. Uh, normally you feel always a little panic uh, if you need to uh, leave a little gap, but now on stage seven, then uh, I, I could hang on and at one point uh, I needed to drop from her. Um, I thought, okay, it's okay. I just focus on my own race now. Um, don't panic. And uh, yeah, I mean, then it was also a very long solo for me and um, yeah, it was different, but uh, yeah, I mean, she's from another world. <laughs> she is. But we had Kasia Nuvadoma on stage with us both yesterday, didn't we? And she said something really interesting, that you are a game changer in that you didn't just accept Van Vluten's going to go and I'm going to accept that she's just going to go. I mean, mm -hmm. you talked about clinging on, staying on that wheel, riding your own race, and it was a game changer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I think she's beatable. I, and 
because everybody's beatable, only we didn't find out how yet, and uh, I'm really busy with finding out how we need to beat her, but um, yeah, I, I expect also from the other girls that they want to beat her, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, you want to be the best, and if you, need, need to, if you want to be the best, then you need to beat her, of course, so uh, yeah, I wanted to, to do that in the tour, of course, already. Um, but didn't work, but no problem, I will try again. There's, an there's another year. Yeah. <laughs> and I say another year because people have started saying, well, and Mink Van Vluten's going to retire, but y you want to beat her before that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that, uh, yeah, if you cannot do it before, then, uh, then it's always a question also for yourself, uh, because uh, it's also something she said to me, it comes by years. I mean, she's already a lot longer in, into cycling and every year you train a bit more and a bit harder and you get every year a little bit stronger and better. Um, so yeah, if she stops next year, then uh, maybe I'm not on my top yet. So that's a bit of pity. And then you also cannot compare it anymore um, with her, of course. So I mean, she's important for cycling because she also lifts the whole women's bunch to another level. We need to train as hard as she does because, yeah, we want to beat her. So we also need to do that work. I'm aware that um, I've only got time for probably one more question, and I really want to get this one in before we actually put some questions out to the audience. Um, the Dutch squad, you have so... In fact, every single person at points going to Worlds, going to Olympics, are winners within your team, <laughs> within your national squad. How on earth do you manage that dynamic when any one of you could go for that victory? Yeah, that's difficult, of course. I mean, uh, normally you're, uh, you're comp competitors from each other, and uh, yeah, then suddenly on another race you need to be teammates. Um, that's always a bit difficult, of course, but. Uh, I think we are all professionals, so um, yeah, you just do it uh, also a bit for your country, of course. I mean, we come all from the same country, and as soon as we put the orange kit on, you're, you're teammates. So um, in the race, you always also feel as teammates, um, and you don't think so much anymore. Um, but of course, this is different uh, for Holland, I think, uh, especially, uh, yeah, uh, in the meetings already, it's, uh, yeah, who is getting a chance, um, that's, that's a bit, uh, always uh, a big question. Uh, and um, we always try to talk multiple times about it, and uh, yeah, it's, it's also the day. I mean, you can say, um, now, Demi, now it's your turn to go on the World Championships, but then you have COVID, <laughs> for example. Um, yeah, it, that can happen so much in racing, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's all kind of situations uh, yeah, coming together. And um, I mean, we're also professionals, so yeah, you just deal with it. And uh, yeah, you just go uh, with each other uh, in the same race and uh, try to make the best of it. Oh, it has just been fascinating. As you can tell, I want to keep this chat going all day, but we're going to have to close soon. And I'm really aware that we, as I mentioned, have some children in the audience. And I'd like to see if anyone's got any questions for Demi, and we'll bring a microphone round to you. Two, time for two questions. I know it's a bit scary putting your hand up, but I'm sure we've got one over here, I think. Um, the impression I got when you were at Park was you were a bit more of a sprinter. I don't know if that was because of the races you were doing when you were with them. And obviously now you're winning the Mountains jersey at the Tour. How was, and, you know, physically, it looks like you, your whole body shape changed. I just wondered how that was. Was that your decision? Was that a coach's decision? Or where that came about? Um, I think um, I'm not a pure sprinter. I mean, I'm not, uh, not a kind of uh, rider like Lorena, but... Um, I have that punch in me, um, but that punch gets better after a really hard race. So I really need that um, uh, a hard race uh, to to show my punch a bit. I think um, it's a bit. Um, I think in the race I also feel it. In the beginning, beginning of the race, I sometimes have it really hard, and then in the end of the race, I think where's the rest now? And I feel really good, but. I think my level stays a bit on the same. I always say I'm a, I'm a diesel, so yeah, I'm over the whole race pretty consistent, and yeah, 
the most of the riders are in the beginning of the race super good and then the fatigue come in and they get a little bit less good and I think I'm pretty stable or something. So in the end of the race I can have that punch. But for, of course I did um, last year a lot of um, focus on, on the longer efforts for longer climbs. Um, and uh, also I did a lot of VO2 max trainings because this is also good for the shorter efforts but also for the for the longer efforts. Um, yeah, I think I, I need hard races and um, big mountains are, uh, yeah, already big uh, hard races, of course. So yeah, I think that that helps a lot. That uh, yeah, after a hard race, I have still kind of a punch. And we're going to take our final question just from the front. Um, what was your best moment in the tour? My best memory? Um, that's a good question. I think when I got the polka dot jersey and I saw my whole family behind uh, shouting for me. Oh, I can see you're emotional. You're yeah. making me emotional. <laughs> oh, what a lovely note to end on before I start weeping up here. <laughs> Please put your hands together for Demi Vollering.